Okay, who am I talking about? 30 books, dozens of professional and volunteer organizations, 17 honorary doctorates, 11 major awards, four shelters that she started from scratch, and a million causes. When it comes to June Callwood, you really don't have to go through that list. We all know what she does. We all marvel at how much she does. We all know how important she is to any sense we have of ourselves as a caring society. And we are inspired by her unshakable belief that people, real people, can make good things happen. June? Thanks, Michael. You feel so stupid coming up with a purse. <laughs> when, when my mother was buried, my sister and I are sitting back in the, in the limousine of the undertaker, and we get out to go to the graveside, each of us, with our purse. Um, I represent the ovarian half of the world. Okay. I'll, tr I'll try it sitting down for a little bit. Um, I need to do kind of a backstory because uh, um, I, I don't want you fleeing to the uh, exits when I say I'd really like to talk to you about children. The uh, backstory is that 40 something years ago, I was. Um, Actually, I was scrubbing the basement stairs thinking, I'm tired of writing about Larry Mann. Now, I didn't mean Larry Mann per se. I meant it as a kind of a, a, a systemic problem that I was interviewing people of mild celebrity in Canada for Maclean's magazine articles, and I was, I was puzzled at how much they were all chameleons in a sense. They, uh, if they had... Uh, a, a, a servant, the servant would see a different person than the, the person's mother would see, and uh, thought, that, where is the core? Where is, are people's core? And how do, they, how do all, we all develop a core? So I happened to be pregnant at the time, and, uh, I t and it was a problematic pregnancy because I was getting awfully old, not as old as I am now, but awfully old. <laughs> and so um, I, I took almost a year off, and I spent it, uh, the year of the pregnancy, I spent it in the stacks at the University of Toronto, Sig Sam Library, reading psychology and philosophy, and, and trying to understand how people form their core. And um, I, because I didn't finish high school, I'm awfully happy about those university degrees that I got on an honorary basis. I wouldn't... <laughs> um, and in that uh, long and delicious research, I learned um, what now is a, a common knowledge, but was not as well known then to, uh, to lay people, how formative the first uh, couple of years of life are when you just think this wonderful little person is just a, uh, the best toy you ever had in your life. What is really going on? And I went, embarked upon this plan. The plan is that every baby born on the planet has a good start. And so I become vice president of the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. It's all lawyers and law professors. And I'm the only ovarian vice president. <laughs> and I, I was vice president for 24 years and never became president. I just, I just leave it there, doesn't <laughs> And I, so I said to the founding group, um, you know, it's all very well to talk about people's rights, their human rights. We're talking mostly, though, about their rights as an adult, the right, you know, the right to property rights. It turns out to be a lot of it. Um, and, but what about their right to get a start that gives them a chance, that helps develop them intelligently and stabilizes them emotionally? So I said, uh, what about we look at early environment and its consequences on mental stability? And they said, uh, I don't think that's a civil liberties issue, June. 
Oh, I said, I didn't really mean it. I was just, uh, you know, I was, I, I was also the only, because I wasn't the only, I was the only person who wasn't a lawyer. I was trying very hard to be um, as smart as a lawyer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, then I, so that was over. And then I hear of another organization. Justice for Children. Well, I'm right there, and I think I became president of that one. And, uh, <laughs> and I, we were sitting around in living rooms, the way you start organizations, and I said, that someone said, we have to work on children with learning disabilities. All this is now uh, well established, but these were primitive organizations when there wasn't anything else on the ground. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. And someone else said, and children in disputed uh, custody cases have a right to legal representation. Oh, I thought that's good, too. And I, then I said, thinking I was talking to my group, you know, the other thing that we need to do is guarantee every child affection, continuity, and stimulation at birth. Well, they said. So um, I moved on. <laughs> and came across a group of people who were meeting to discuss the problem as they saw it, that teenagers who were, um, uh, who were pregnant were not giving up their babies for uh, adoption anymore. They were keeping them, and they were unfit mothers by definition, and what were we all going to do about that? So I became chair of that right away and, <laughs> and said, I've got an idea. Why don't we give those babies a wonderful start? And it, we started something in Toronto called Jesse's, and... Uh, the lost leader is a, um, a swap shop full of baby clothes and toys and things that sometimes helps. And we have a school program and a, a public health nurse and, uh, and, and parenting education on a, on a, with the babies there. We'll do a, a video of a mother playing with her six-weeks-old baby. And, and she's just adoring the baby, can't wait to get the baby dressed in another outfit. Um, we all have to start somewhere. And, and we say, look at that baby smile when you did that. Did you see how the baby loved what you just did? So the mom teaches herself to be a good mom. And there's 300 teenagers a year come into Jessie's pregnant. And some of them live on the street. And we almost never have a baby that has to be taken into care. Now, this is my proposal. <laughs> this is my idea. First of all, why don't we make it obvious that we have children in a city? Well, the, the, the children are the in, in, invisible citizens. There's nothing for their, at their scale. I like the uh, changing tables now in, in public washrooms, especially when they're in the men's washroom. I, I, I once... Uh, um, liberated a man's washroom because the lineup in front of the women's was so long. <laughs> and, <laughs> and there was a baby changing table for the men. Uh, now that's progress. But uh, except for a few things which have just started to emerge, there's no evidence that a city is full of very tiny, tiny people. There are uh, regulations about uh, building an apartment house which pertain to car parking spaces but no regulations pertaining to where are your children going to play and what are your teenagers going to be able to do in a, living in a, what is often a congested apartment. What life can they have? What kind of street life can they have that is a healthy street life if there is no planned recreation, no community center, no place to do their homework uh, where they, they can concentrate? So don't you have to have building regulations? Shouldn't you be obliged to think about all these small people and especially the teenagers. The frustration of teenagers, when they're, especially when they're poor, is uh, overwhelming. The only thing that they're going to make any money at is the women as prostitutes and the men as drug dealers. And that's, that's a, a kind of a, a economic arrangement which isn't to their advantage. I'm a co-chair of uh, something. I'm the oldest person in the room usually, so I get to run everything. And I'm co-chair of the, camp the Canadian Campaign Against Child Poverty. Uh, Rabbi Arthur Bielfeld and I are co-chair. He never lets me chair.
I am perfectly good chair. But he doesn't. He starts with rabbinical jokes. Oh. Anyway. We get a lot done. We, st we started about six years ago, and um, we de determined that um, helpful as it may be and seem to people to be the very most wonderful thing going on, school breakfasts, hot lunches, food banks, we didn't see that that was the solution to child poverty. So what is the solution? We decided it was public opinion. Until you get a critical mass of, of, of voting population that says we care about children, you aren't going to get politicians to do anything. And I remember our first meeting with Paul Martin when he was finance minister, and what we were keen on then was to get um, early childhood education and care uh, in, into our everywhere and free uh, quality, just part of the school system. Edgerton Ryerson, who started public school system in this part of uh, Canada, thought kids could start to learn at six wrong. Uh, I'd, I'd tell him if I knew him that he's wrong because learning starts almost at birth, but certainly by two and a half, uh, it does children a lot of good if they can have even part-time uh, quality uh, childcare. So we, talk, we told him all this and had all the best people there. The Martha Friendly, who's been working on this for 20 years at the University of Toronto, and uh, Marvin uh, Novak, who is uh, at, teaches at Ryerson, and, uh, and uh, Laurel Rothman, who's head of Campaign 2000, all the best people, and they told him all this stuff. The thing that did seem to help was that if you give a child a good start, they're less expensive as they become adults, and they pay better taxes. Whatever works. Um, but he said, no, there's nobody in my caucus who would be the least bit interested in what he called childcare. There would be, it's impossible. Uh, if I brought it up, I'd be laughed at. Well, just yesterday, he said he has to pass his budget because Canada wants childcare. He's still calling it childcare. <laughs> so. Uh, now, this is pretty hard to understand for all of us, but maybe you don't know what's called the clawback. Uh, Paul Martin did, did get his, the point, and John Manley too, something called the, early, uh, the, the childhood tax benefit. And it was to go to low-income families in all the provinces. And in all the provinces except two, they felt that if they gave it to welfare mothers, they would not get off welfare. So they took the, the money that was to go to them for their children and put it in other things. And the only people who didn't get the income supplement in Canada were the lowest income mothers. This is what is, is called as, I won't call it masculine logic because I know a lot of dumb women too, but, <laughs> but it, uh, it's, it's a way of thinking that, uh, that, that is, uh, it's, it's very hard. It, like the, uh, the, the speaker who talked about people's beliefs that if you believe you've got a, a diamond as big as a refrigerator in your backyard and that sustains you, okay. So we have a belief that um, all mothers are superb at raising kids and they have adequate, they, they have adequate job skills and if you give them too much money to raise their kids, then they won't ever work, and they will be a burden on society. That's the diamond as big as a refrigerator. Okay. So, well, we're, we're plugging away. We're getting, um, we're getting a little better. But I, I think sometimes that about the animal species, that it is so careful with, it, with its young, uh, lions and, and ugly animals too, iguanas. <laughs> <laughs> they take care of their young. They want, they want them to be very good iguanas. <laughs> And the whole culture of being an iguana is built around taking care of these awful looking little <laughs> iguanas. But the culture 
of the human being is not built around making a generation sane and outgoing and, and fully realized as best a person can ever realize themselves, at least a chance to do that. The culture is, um, is still not child-centered, it just says it is. So that's what I'm proposing, a child-centered for one generation. Let's try it and see what kind of a world we have. Thank you.